Welcome everyone. We are so glad you've joined us here at Cal State LA for the second annual CCAN City Center Symposium on Urban Sustainability. My name is Emily Allen and I'm Dean of the College of Engineering, Computer Science and Technology here at Cal State Los Angeles. We are a college of 3,000 students and 75 faculty in an urban university of 24,000 students. LA and the gateway to the San Gabriel Valley and all of its thriving smaller cities. This event is sponsored by the Secand City Center. I would especially like to thank Mark Secand and the Secand Family Foundation, which has been a generous supporter of the college for decades and whose gifts have allowed us to establish the Secand City Center for Urban Sustainability. The center was established to promote faculty and student research in urban sustainability and related topics and to keep us connected to sustainability practitioners in the urban communities of the city and county of Los Angeles. I would especially also like to thank Dr. Mehran Mazari, Professor of Civil Engineering and the Faculty Director of the Seekend City Center, who has organized today's symposium along with the symposium planning and technical committees has put together a program that I'm sure you will enjoy and learn from. Today, as we get ready to hear from professionals who work on various aspects of improving sustainability in the Los Angeles region, let's consider the scale and the timeline of sustainability. Cities and urban areas first developed several millennia ago in the early centers of human civilization. It has only been in the last 200 years that urbanization occurred in the United States, moving us from a largely agrarian and rural population to an industrialized urban one. Today, some 83% of the people of the United States live in urban areas. Los Angeles was only incorporated as a city in 1850, and the entire surrounding area has urbanized rapidly only over the last 100 years. But let us stop for a moment and acknowledge, as we come up on the Thanksgiving holiday, that this land was originally occupied by the Tongva people who live sustainably upon this land. It is now upon us to confront the urgency of climate change and quality of life in our urban areas and to continue to find sustainable solutions to support our present diverse population. We are a college of engineering, computer science, and technology, and so we naturally seek technical solutions to the complex problems of sustainability. But it is also incumbent upon us to educate our young people with a sense of the urgent necessity to make change, as well as with the hope and possibility of that change. Technical solutions alone will not make Los Angeles a sustainable urban area. We must also confront homelessness, systemic racism, and the ever-widening income inequality gap that is pervasive in Los Angeles and around the country. Here at Cal State LA, we strive to, to provide the broad education that our students need to give back to their communities and make LA a better place to live. Some of our presentations this morning will focus on sustainable solutions for our own universities here in Southern California. Here at Cal State LA, we built and operate a hydrogen generation and fueling research station. I hope all of you with fuel cell cars are familiar with our station and our regular customers. We are also home to the National Science Foundation funded Center for Energy and Sustainability, which under the leadership of Arturo Pacheco Vega, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, over the last 10 years has supported dozens of faculty and hundreds of students conducting research in sustainable energy with research thrusts on making existing energy technologies more efficient, as well as pursuing emerging alternate energy technologies that are not reliant on fossil fuels. We have seen how the world's medical scientists have created what appear to be effective vaccines in less than a year, an unprecedented speed for vaccine development motivated by an extreme and deadly sense of urgency. The solutions needed now to make our city sustainable for everyone who lives in them is the hardest problem we have ever faced. We have seen that it is challenging to create a long-term sense of urgency in people and to encourage them to link their own survival with others who do not live in the same community. 
This summer's protests in support of Black Lives Matter activated many different kinds of people to stand up for justice. Today I ask, can we activate people to stand up for sustainability solutions? Today's speakers will present their work on sustainability for the city of LA, the city of West Hollywood, and sustainable building initiatives. We'll hear from LA Metro and UC Berkeley on transportation initiatives, from UC San Diego on advanced wildfire modeling, get a look at the LA river restoration, and hear from UCLA, CSUN, and Cal State LA on zero carbon plans for campuses. I look forward to a morning of deep learning from all of these speakers who are professionals in their field. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Dave Carlscott from Brailsford and Dunlavey. Dave is a director for BND's Energy and Utilities Practice Group. He has a decade of experience delivering sustainability solutions with an expertise in greenhouse gas mitigation, energy and financial modeling, data visualization and facilitation. Dave is currently leading energy transition and carbon mitigation efforts at the UC system and the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Dave also hosts the Campus Energy and Sustainability podcast. The podcast uses a long form interview format where Dave talks with leading professionals, thought leaders, engineers and innovators on the broad topics of energy and sustainability. And now on with the show. Dave, take it away. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, as Dean Allen just said, uh, my name is Dave Carlscott and I'm an energy and sustainability consultant uh, and also a podcast host. But something she didn't mention, which she probably didn't know herself, is that my background is actually in music. And so I'm going to use that as a bit of a theme today. I was actually a jazz musician and in particular a jazz arranging major which basically involved creating enough of a score that I could bring together highly talented uh, musician friends of mine to come together and make something better together. So I think that's basically what we're gonna be doing today. Uh, today's symposium is gonna be a bit of a sustainability jam session. Uh, in our first section, you're gonna hear from four different sustainability professionals a bit about their work. They're each gonna give us a, sh a short presentation and then we're gonna dive into a discussion uh, with with all of them together. I think one of our panelists is actually uh, presenting to Congress right now, so he may be a little late to join, but we'll use the improvisational skills uh, that we've all developed during our, our COVID times. Um, since it's only 9 a.m., I may be taking this evening jam session analogy a bit too far, but for now, I'll commit to it and announce our first soloist, uh, who is Nancy Sutley. Uh, Nancy is the Senior Assistant General Manager of External and Regulatory Affairs and the Chief Sustainability Officer at LADWP, or Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Uh, so take it away, Nancy. Uh, thanks so much, Dave. And thank you to Cal State LA uh, for inviting me. And thank you for all that uh, Cal State LA does uh, for the community and, and for uh, training the next generation of, of leaders in Los Angeles. So very pleased to be here, um, just waiting for are my slides up? I can't see them. Oh, oh there we go. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so uh, let me start by just saying a few words about the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Uh, we are the, the nation's largest municipally owned utility. So we are part of the city of Los Angeles and we serve uh, power and water to the 4 million residents of Los Angeles. Uh, please go to the next slide. So today I'm going to talk about um, some of the goals that the city has set uh, to get to Los Angeles to be a net uh, zero carbon city by 2050. So this is the LA's Green New Deal that Mayor Eric Garcetti released uh, in uh, 2019 that sets goals for the city to ensure that uh, we can meet what they've called the five zeros. So by 2050, net zero electricity, uh, net zero transportation, net zero buildings, um, net zero waste, uh, and zero wasted water. Uh, all of that, an effort to make sure that Los Angeles uh, continues to lead in the fight against climate change. 
So for the LA Department of Water and Power, as you can imagine, as the producer of electricity and the, um, and the gatherer of water for Angelinos, uh, that we're involved in many of the goals uh, and objectives that are in LA's Green New Deal. So whether it's uh, reaching the uh, goal to recycle 100% of the wastewater or to get to 100% renewable energy, uh, even in thinking about things like uh, waste um, and waste, waste in landfills, um, certainly a very important topic around green jobs and how do we ensure uh, that this plan helps to create green jobs in Los Angeles. And also uh, we have been the, the primary funder of tree planting efforts by the city because um, of their uh, importance in helping us to save energy. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm digging a little deeper on some of the energy goals that are in LA's Green New Deal. Uh, so it's really around transforming the way that we produce, uh, distribute, and manage uh, the electricity that drives our city. Uh, so increasing the amount of renewable energy uh, on our system, uh, helping our customers to save energy, that also helps us to better manage the grid, uh, to reduce the energy use in buildings, um, and to make sure that uh, buildings which account for about 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the state uh, help to uh, help to be a, um, uh, an, a tool for climate neutrality uh, and not hinder it. Um, also, we play an important role around zero emission vehicles. Uh, so as we look at electric vehicles, you need electricity obviously to power them. And so the infrastructure that's necessary to keep those vehicles charged, whether it's uh, passenger cars, uh, or uh, the buses, uh, Metro, uh, you'll hear from Chris, Le Chris LeBond later, um, Metro has goals to get to 100% uh, electric buses, as does the Los Angeles Department of Transportation, which runs the DASH system. And also working with our partners, our city partners at the Port of Los Angeles, uh, which has an ambitious goal uh, to, uh, to electrify the port, to get it to be a net zero uh, port uh, in, the, in the 2030s. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, that's a, there we go. Thanks. Uh, so as, as the slide's coming up, I mean, would we and so these are not far off goals, um, especially uh, when you talk about infrastructure. Uh, these, you know, it takes a long time to replace infrastructure. So we've really been making significant progress towards meeting these goals. We've cut our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, about in half, uh, well ahead of the uh, state's target of a 40% reduction by 2030. Uh, our renewal percentage is higher. This was for calendar year 2019. So we're at close to 40% renewables. Uh, we are the number one and have been since 2017, the number one solar city in the US, the most installed solar in any city in, it, in the country. And we're moving forward with projects to eliminate uh, our re last remaining coal plant in Utah by 2025, and also investing in uh, large utility scale solar and wind projects uh, that will help uh, us use, capture and use this renewable energy. And very importantly, um, we've been very aggressive around helping our customers save energy. It helps the grid, it helps people save money. And so uh, we, uh, we've we achieved our 15% energy savings uh, by 2020, which was uh, a goal we established uh, in 2015 and will continue on that trajectory uh, to uh, to reduce our energy use. Next slide. Next slide, please. It's, um, but we can't do this without really addressing um, important issues that uh, are are you know critical to our city. Uh, LA is a very diverse city on any possible way you can think about diversity. And so as we as we move to these. Uh, important greenhouse gas goals, we also can use this as a tool to help to improve equity outcomes for Angelinos. Um, so green job growth, uh, looking at uh, how we can help support opportunities for uh, whether it's engineers uh, or 
uh, technicians or people who are installing solar panels or uh, maintaining electric vehicle chargers, um, and importantly, start startup companies that are coming up with the new techniques and new technologies that will help us achieve this goal. Uh, also, out of this plan, um, our air quality improve, will improve. Uh, Los Angeles still has the worst smog in the nation, uh, and and these decarbonization efforts also have the benefit of reducing uh, smog forming emissions, which which uh, lead to uh, hospitalization uh, and death. Um, and then making sure that we are uh, thinking and being very deliberate about targeting incentives that uh, will help to grow these, uh, grow the green economy and grow these uh, green techniques uh, to make sure that we are uh, in making them available um, and really uh, targeting them towards disadvantaged communities. And then finally, thinking about how um, all of these efforts will help to improve the resiliency of the city uh, to natural disasters and the impacts of climate change uh, by making our power system more distributed that will help support communities in, in times of need. And then just to give you a little bit of a snapshot of what's going on, um, the California continues to lead the way in the growth of uh, uh, electric transportation, whether it's passenger cars, you can see the percentage of, uh, of uh, sales of EVs. California uh, accounts for about two thirds of the electric vehicles sold across the country. But I think more importantly, uh, thinking broadly about transportation electrification. So you can see the dash bus on the bottom. Uh, the middle picture is one of our uh, bucket trucks that goes to um, uh, repair power lines when there's a problem. Uh, this is a hybrid that has both uh, batteries for operating the, uh, the cherry picker, the lift, uh, as well as a, a diesel engine to get the vehicle in various places, and also looking at our own fleets. Uh, so uh, you can see in a, uh, I'm not sure what kind of car that is, but that's one of our uh, fleet vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. And you really can't talk about sustainability in Los Angeles without addressing water. Uh, water is critical in this uh, arid environment, uh, how we manage water. And so really the, the LA's Green New Deal um, takes a very comprehensive look at how do we make sure uh, that Los Angeles has the water it needs uh, now and into the future. And that's really about first and foremost reducing our water use, um, which we've done very successfully in Los Angeles. We use less water today than we did 40 years ago, uh, even though we've added more than a million people to our population. Uh, but we can do more in terms of uh, recycling our wastewater, uh, capturing uh, stormwater, so capturing the rain when it does come, and really moving to a system where we're sourcing our water locally rather than uh, relying primarily on imports of water from hundreds of miles away, which is, which is where we are currently. Uh, next slide, please. And so you can see from uh, from this picture, really the point about shifting uh, from uh, a, a water system that's primarily uh, reliant on imports of water. So the, the blue uh, slice is the Los Angeles Aqueduct, uh, which is which serves only the city of Los Angeles, but it's located uh, in the Eastern Sierras and the Eastern side of the Sierras that brings water from the Owens Valley into Los Angeles and also the Metropolitan Water District, which brings water from Northern California and from the Colorado River into, into Los Angeles. Uh, and really, uh, we have uh, for decades, uh, this picture of where the water comes from has been pretty, uh, pretty steady. Uh, and we're really moving to one where we can rely more on local sources of water, whether it's groundwater, recycled water, uh, captured storm water, or water conservation. Uh, so that's the end of my slides. Thank you uh, for listening. I'm really um, excited to be part of this discussion. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, next up, we have, uh, make sure I get the right order here. Um, Pardon me. We have Ben Stapleton, uh, who's the executive director of the U.S. Uh, Green Building Council Los Angeles chapter. So go ahead, Ben. 
Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me at Cal State LA. I just want to say thank you to, to Nancy and Chris and Eric and everyone else who's speaking this morning uh, for all the, the good work they do. Um, I'm the executive director for the U.S. Green Building Council Los Angeles. Uh, we're independent from the National Green Building Council, and our mission is really to use the built environment as the entry point uh, to help make Southern California a more sustainable region for all. Um, and 2020 used to be a phrase for perfect vision, uh, but this year has been just about as distorted as they come. Uh, in the green building world, we were on track to make this the year of decarbonization. Uh, we had envisioned a year of progress on electrification, uh, transparency on building materials, uh, and so much more. Uh, well, needless to say, our clients, our thought leaders, and society overall has had to address other priorities. Uh, and it is easy to view our hope for progress on green buildings this year is just another one of 2020's tragedies. Uh, however, if we take a moment to have some perspective on the pandemic and its impact on the work we do, uh, there are some reasons to be hopeful about what is yet to come. Uh, first of all, people everywhere are much more aware of the condition of their environments, uh, from airflow and ventilation to cleaning practices and building entry technology, uh, and the potential impact of the space they occupy on their health. Uh, overall, we are seeing a focus on building technology and systems that we just haven't seen in some time. Additionally, though I foresee that capital will be constrained in the real estate sector, especially in commercial office and retail, what we will see is an increased investment and use of innovative technologies and buildings to reduce long-term operating costs through increased efficiency, demand response, and improved flexibility as buildings respond to changes in use and occupancy uh, that they just haven't seen quite before. And in support of these issues, uh, our Net Zero Accelerator pilots and promotes technology to enable a net zero future. And our Healthy Building Alliance provides a framework and a commitment to make healthy spaces uh, accessible for all. Uh, secondly, we are living through a profound moment where we are debating and defining the future of work, uh, including workplace design, a continued blurring of, of work-life boundaries, as I'm sure we're all experiencing, uh, and workday structure. Uh, I believe that even when we have a vaccine, there will not be a return to normal. Uh, there will be a slow return to the future workplace, and that will include a permanent telecommuting shift of at least 20 to 30 percent of our professional workforce. Um, this will mean changes to how companies manage their real estate portfolios, uh, leaning to, to more of a hub and spoke model where traditional office space is used more for collaborative work and client facing interaction, uh, but less for day to day workers. This means that while work might extend more into the home in a permanent way, perhaps we can use this as an opportunity for employers to take more responsibility for employer work from home environments, including energy use, indoor air quality, ergonomics and waste. If managed correctly, correctly we can also find ways to capture the reduced emissions and GHG benefits of decreased automotive use in the process. Uh, right now as an organization, we're working on, on several white papers around these issues, including a, a white paper on the post-COVID impacts of telecommuting, uh, a white paper on the post-COVID impacts to our waste stream, especially looking at single-use plastics, and then one that I'm really excited about, which is really looking at how we can improve carbon offsets and create more local opportunities for, for projects through that process. Uh, third, the increased focus on racial and social equity gives us an incredible opportunity uh, to make sure these issues become permanent pillars of the sustainability movement you know, the societal change challenges we have dealt with this year uh, speak to the importance of resilience and equity at the heart of the planning process. Uh, and the concept of sustainability is an elegant principle to address both of these while improving the environment. Uh, we should lean into this further as we, as the deeper we dig around environmental justice issues, we realize that the ongoing pollution, critical resource contamination, and lack of access to clean green spaces are also racial justice issues and really have been all along. Uh, the pandemic has highlighted the dramatic differences in personal health and the ability to withstand the systematic shocks between the haves and the have-nots, which climate change has only exasperated further. Um, we need to close this gap through education and engagement, shifts to diversify how we develop our workforce of the future, bringing context and community awareness to sustainability as a way to increase long-term wage growth and career opportunities while improving the world around us. We are working towards this through our, our Green Schools Initiative, our digital talent portal that we launched this year, as well as our Green Building Core, which allows unemployed or underemployed people to gain experience, build relationships, and better position themselves for employment. I encourage you to check all those initiatives out uh, on our website at www.usgbc-la.org. 
Um, so in, in closing, take heart, my friends. Uh, this has been a difficult year for everyone and uh, challenges sustainability in general and losing prioritization amongst a shifting landscape of societal needs. Uh, but like any challenge, this moment has likely better positioned us for long-term success if we use its lessons the right way. Uh, stop lamenting over what could have been and start being hopeful for what yet could be, working even more collaboratively than we have before. This work will be needed to support our public partners who are facing dramatic budget shortfalls that will challenge their ability to make progress in the near term. And it will be needed to help our large corporations see the forest of the trees in terms of long-term return on investment and brand equity as we help them make commitments to zero emissions across their portfolios. So take advantage of this time around the holidays as we likely quarantine in a more serious way in the weeks to come. Pick up the phone, send that email, text, whatever it is you crazy kids do these days and connect with someone to plan, collaborate and inspire for the year ahead. Let's make 2021 synonymous with the year we took action together in spite of everything in this decade of climate change. Thank you for having me this morning. Great, thanks, Ben. Uh, next up, we'll keep going around the horn here. Uh, we have Eric Hoek. Um, Eric is the faculty director and uh, part of the UCLA Sustainability LA Grand Challenge. So take it away, Eric. Uh, thank you. Can you all hear me? Loud and clear. Great. And I'm going to try to share my screen uh, to show a few slides. Are you all able to see the slide on screen? Not quite, but we'll give it a moment. Try that again. By the way, while Ben's or Eric's pulling up his slides, if you do have questions for any of our uh, guests, uh, please feel free to type in the chat window. You can, there's a Q&A section. Um, we'll be you know, trying to pull from those questions as we get into the discussion. So again, sorry, I'm trying to share my screen to, uh, to show some PowerPoint slides, but if it's not going to work, I can just speak to it. Um, so uh, I'm Eric Hoek, I'm a professor at UCLA in engineering, and uh, nice to see some uh, friendly faces, uh, Ben, Nancy, uh, everyone else. And just want to thank the uh, the Cal State LA and the Sican City Center uh, for organizing the event and uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, so my research uh, at UCLA largely uh, has to do with um, technologies for uh, treating water. Uh, but as uh, the years have gone on, I've, uh, I've gotten into a few other things, uh, including um, some research now that we're doing, uh, which relates to converting um, wet organic uh, sort of waste materials, if you will. So it could be uh, not exciting to talk about, but sludge from a wastewater treatment plant or food waste uh, and converting that into um, fuels and, and chemicals and feedstocks. Uh, in particular, you know, targeting biofuels as a sort of an intermediate uh, source of fuel, which um, we're going to need. We can electrify uh, our, our personal vehicles. We can electrify, you know, sort of light and medium duty transportation, but long haul and, and air transportation and uh, and uh, uh, marine transportation uh, really uh, aren't able to do with, you know, battery power the way we can with our phones and our cars and whatnot. Um, so until we come up with a longer term solution for some of those other forms of transportation, we're going to need uh, some lower carbon uh, sources of fuels. So I, I see a slide on my screen. I'm wondering if everybody sees that now. And I'm not sure if I'm controlling it uh, or if uh, the organizers are controlling it. I think the organizers you... are controlling it, Eric. So yeah, yeah please. Proceed. Yeah, great. OK, so we can go to the next slide. Uh, and I'll, and I'll just speak to that. So then, uh, as I said, you know, work on water treatment and, and it's what I call waste of value. Uh, and then the third area is uh, what I call energy from water. And so uh, we can take waters of different um, salt concentrations like seawater, for example, and uh, uh, a fresh water or even a wastewater. And there's an energy that can be extracted by mixing these two sources. Uh, and so, for example, we've looked at uh, in various ways, 
um, ways that you could lower the dramatically lower the energy consumption, for example, at a seawater desalination plant by uh, combining uh, the seawater concentrate, which goes back out into the ocean with wastewater and uh, creating uh, positive energy from that uh, mixing process. And that offsets um, a significant amount up to about 40 percent potentially of the energy that's consumed by the desalination process, for example. Uh, and it, it also comes is a productive use of the wastewater, which otherwise is simply discharged to the ocean uh, without gaining any uh, useful work from it. And then the other area is a, a process for producing hydrogen uh, cleanly uh, via electrolysis. We can split uh, water molecules into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas using electricity uh, derived from the sun. And hydrogen, uh, we don't yet really have a robust hydrogen economy. There, um, Mayor Garcetti just gave some remarks uh, recently about um, con uh, conversion of uh, some of the um, natural gas fire power plants that we get our electricity from over time, partially into hydrogen and natural gas, and then eventually uh, completely uh, powered by hydrogen. Uh, but today, to do that, the way hydrogen is produced, it comes from a process called steam methane reforming, which means it's derived from fossil fuels. Uh, so today, hydrogen is not clean. It's actually uh, fossil fuel derived. Uh, but in the future, it can be produced cleanly. So uh, next slide, please. So the, the kind of work that we do uh, in my lab or have done over the years, we've had uh, some opportunities to take some of the, the science and the, the engineering and, and technological innovations uh, off campus outside the university. And so this is uh, just showing uh, a handful of companies uh, that we've created over the years, targeting uh, different types of uh, applications, uh, some advanced materials that uh, we've developed uh, that have turned into uh, variously different uh, membrane filtration products for filtering water, uh, for recycling wastewater, for uh, doing desalination, uh, and also uh, in some biomedical applications, uh, hydrophilics, for example, is uh, bringing to market a catheter that resists infection uh, for uh, implants in the body. Uh, and then we've done some software automation and controls and, and, and some other kind of businesses over the years. Um, but overall, I mean, the whole motivation behind all of this is, um, you know, whenever we're tackling any of these these problems, it's really about lowering energy demand, you know, reducing costs, minimizing environmental implications or, or impacts of uh, whatever we're doing uh, in the course. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a little bit about my background. I want to shift gears now and talk a little bit about UCLA uh, more broadly. And... Uh, at UCLA, we have over 200 uh, urban sustainability faculty doing research on, on various aspects of, of urban sustainability, uh, spanning a whole range of topics. And I'm listing here just a few of the campus units and some of the um, uh, centers, institutes, programs on campus. Uh, I'm not going to speak to every one of them, but um, the point is that we have um, such a broad interest in sustainability from law to public policy to arts and architecture and the humanities, all the way into science, medicine, public health, engineering. There are over 50 undergraduate student groups that have formed uh, spontaneously by the interest of the students across UCLA. Uh, and so just to give you a sense of how sort of immersed we are on campus in uh, sustainability as one of our core values, if you will. Uh, and, and because of this broad interest uh, that has been around for uh, quite a few years, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. In 2013, UCLA launched a campus-wide initiative uh, called the Sustainable LA Grand Challenge. And our vision is for Los Angeles to be the most livable, equitable, resilient, clean and healthy megacity in the world, an example for the world. Uh, for other me megacities around the world. Uh, so what the grand challenge is, uh, within campus, we operate out of the office of the uh, vice chancellor for research. And uh, in January, I was, uh, I officially became the, the faculty director for this uh, program. 
We have a research framework um, that, that has four topical areas, energy, transportation, water, and ecosystems. And then those four sort of pillars, if you will, uh, are verticals. We have a number of cross-cutting themes that bring together all of these diverse uh, folks on campus uh, um, from, like I said, arts and architecture and humanities all the way to, to engineering. Um, but the cross-cutting themes um, that we've identified are uh, equity, access, and justice, uh, human health and well-being, climate and environment, culture, design, and land use, law, policy, and economics, and science, technology, and innovation. And so it's a way for us to think uh, much more holistically uh, about, for example, what I do related to water. Um, I can collaborate with other folks on campus who bring in, you know, wildly different perspectives, uh, such as some of the things that have been said already about uh, equity uh, and, and justice and the implications um, for the technological uh, interventions and, and behavioral interventions and policy interventions um, that we're implementing uh, throughout the region. Uh, and just a few, uh, you know, sort of summarizing, you know, what the Grand Challenge uh, has accomplished to date. Um, we've raised over $80 million in funding for research. And a lot of that research obviously goes to support students who go out into the community and the region and the world uh, and then they work on uh, sustainability related matters. We have uh, supported over 49 different faculty led research projects uh, and we're gonna award uh, a major uh, research award uh, this fall through what we're calling the Sustainability Sand Pit. Uh, and we up to a million dollars for uh, one of the faculty teams. And we've uh, previously placed six graduate uh, research fellows in, in the city uh, mayor's office of sustainability. And this year we have one going to uh, the mayor's office, one going to Chris Lebon and his group at LA Metro and a third one uh, likely going to the county uh, sustainability office. Uh, a number of training programs and things and, and we, we created uh, several years ago, uh, the LA Sustainability Leadership Council. It's co-chaired by the chancellor at UCLA and, and uh, Mayor Garcetti. Uh, and then we publish these, uh, we call report cards uh, on uh, various topics uh, like energy, water, ecosystems uh, so far. Uh, and then all of the research and, and you know, the fellows that we place, some of them actually work in the city and the county now. Uh, so we've definitely had a lot of opportunity to collaborate uh, with the regional stakeholders and kind of get out of the usual mode of academic uh, research and be more engaged uh, regionally in trying to support our our stakeholders, regional stakeholders. Uh, and, and to the extent that some of our uh, staff from the Grand Challenge and, and faculty from campus were on the team that developed the first ever uh, LA County Sustainability Plan. Uh, next slide, please. And it was uh, mentioned, I think, a little bit earlier uh, by Nancy. Uh, some of the targets that we have for the city of LA and how DWP is uh, involved in, in helping to achieve some of those targets. Uh, the one uh, for me that stands out uh, as an opportunity to do, to, to do much more than what is simply stated in the target itself, I think if you advance, there's an animation, but it's the 100% recycling of, of wastewater by 2035. If we think about simply recycling the water, we can treat it, we can distribute it, we can uh, monitor it to assure that it's um, safe and healthy and uh, is appropriately uh, used. Uh, but that all costs energy and consumes energy. And so to, to recycle the wastewater is going to you know, significantly increase the energy demand uh, regionally. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So one of the original uh, premises, if you will, the basis for the, the formation of the research framework for the, the Sustainable LA Grand Challenge was thinking a little bit more holistically, thinking about um, water and waste and energy and carbon uh, in the atmosphere uh, and how we have all of these flows of, of materials and chemicals that can be transformed and shared and moved around through this uh, urban uh industrial ecosystem, if you will. 
And so that's that's sort of the the parting thought I think I want to share is that we have all these various individual sort of targets and initiatives, but I really think that we should be thinking about them in a much more holistic and integrated way. So for example, to recycle wastewater, uh, you generate a massive amount of, of biosolids. And those biosolids uh, today are uh, often turned into compost or land applied uh, somewhere as a fertilizer, um, which is a, a, a legitimate uh, uh, beneficial reuse. But I view that as a source of carbon, which could be used to develop chemicals and fuels in a more sustainable way so that the wastewater itself is no longer looked at as a waste, it's looked at as a feedstock from which we can derive not just fresh water, but also fertilizers, uh, as I say, chemicals, fuels, whatever, what have you, other high value products. And that kind of thinking I think is uh, is important as we, as we go forward. So, so all I had to say, and just wanna thank again, the organizers and uh, the other speakers uh, for being here today. Great, thank you, um, Eric, for uh, that presentation. Um, we are moving on to our next one, and I uh, apologize, I had my notes here. Uh, Stephen Jordan, who is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Institute for Sustainable Development. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna try and uh, share my screen. I hope this works. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, I'm going to do. Oh, well, again, while Stephen's uh, trying to share a screen, if you do have questions for any of our panelists, please use the chat feature. And uh, I think we're having some technical success here. So go ahead when as soon as you're ready. Okay. Uh, let's see how this goes. All right. Um, well, first of all, thank you all so much for ha having me. Thanks, Dave, for moderating this. And um, I think that the first thing I want to do is is really uh, say that, that this presentation builds on Eric's uh, comments about needing to take a more systems based and uh, holistic view of how to uh, how to approach things. I think that that, um, you know, the Institute for Sustainable Development uh, works with I don't know, maybe uh, eight to 10 different uh, municipalities right now on the disaster recovery and resilience framework that's going on. And uh, I have to say that Los Angeles is probably as advanced as anyone else is in the country um, in, a, in a lot of different ways. And I think that there are a lot of promising practices that we can build on and uh, develop. I think if there's anything I want you all to take away from this presentation is that sustainability is not just about bricks and sticks. It is also about social systems. And I think it's really gratifying to see how many of the presenters already have talked about equity and uh, the importance of, of really taking into account social structures. Secondly, sustainability is about addressing different levels of community systems. Third, it needs to be developed across the disaster response continuum. And finally, as I mentioned at the outset, I think Los Angeles has got so many good things happening right now that it just need, it needs to, to really figure out how to develop and build on them. Um, I'm a, I want to apologize for the background noise. It looks like we have a, uh, a timber company uh, uh, taking out a couple of trees behind. But first of all, I want to I want to say that that chronic stresses matter as much as sudden shocks. And if you look at uh, the communities that really have uh, negative or adverse impacts here, it's distributed across the Los Angeles area. You know, there are there are pockets of wealth, and there are pockets of um, of at risk communities all over the region. And one of the one of the challenges and one of the things I think that the George that the George Floyd tragedy precipitated or exposed is that a lot of the dissatisfactions that people have aren't just due to a sudden shock. 
they're really due to underlying conditions that pre-existed and that just festered that no one was really thinking about how to develop a concerted proactive way to address them so in our construct uh, sustainability isn't just about bricks and sticks the water the atmosphere um, emissions all of these things are extremely important but it's also very important to look at the legacy context in which in which they're embedded and also to look at the social context in which they're embedded and i would actually add a fifth uh, context here which is the dynamic or the framework of technology and innovation of what could be possible but i think that the one of the biggest challenges that we currently have is overcoming in some ways the legacies of of earlier generations of decision making and no doubt future generations will be complaining about us just as much but anyway um i think that if you if you look at how this is going um and i think our previous speakers talked to this uh very much i think we're moving away from a reactive siloed proprietary and fragmented and top-down approach to one that's proactive, getting out ahead, recognizing that a dollar spent in resilience is worth more than as much as seven dollars, four to seven dollars in post-disaster costs. Going away from a siloed perspective of saying, okay, we'll have the water or the housing or the health over here towards a, a, a recognition that housing should be dependent on how we're looking at the environment. That the environment is, uh, you know, in a uh, it has to be set in terms of a context, not just of the environment locally, but what's going on up in the Colorado River, or what's going on in terms of air pollution in China. Um, we also have to look at it as interoperable. One of the issues that we have had a hard time dealing with, and I'm speaking as uh, in terms of working with. The, um, a lot of community economic development leaders in LA is the fact that we're experiencing fatigue among small businesses because they have to continuously fill out different individuals and small businesses because they continuously have to fill out different forms for each different agency or foundation or whatever that they have to deal with. One of the things that, that I think is really promising is the conversation that actually riffs off of the college common app idea that we develop a common app for uh, disaster recovery assistance. And I think that um, the other thing that is really gratifying to see in the LA context is not only are we seeing kind of top-down systems starting to come together, but we're also really seeing bottom-up uh, initiatives and people listening to the community, which I think is incredibly important. I think that a lot of this has to do with the fact that the people are studying now kind of the crisis management uh, setup because there's been enormous success over the last uh, 100 years in terms of reducing the, the impacts of sudden shocks. We've gone from situations where earthquakes might kill thousands of people to, to where um, hundreds, if not tens of people are, are, are casualties. There's a, a, a bunch of things that have, have really happened uh, in the crisis management space to help make this work. And I think that we need to start figuring out how to embed these ideas across the continuum of this. We need to embed it in future resilience and preparedness, in steady state sustainability, in emergency response, in relief and stabilization. And we need to embed all of these things in the establishment of the new normal. You know, there was, um, it's a terrible saying in some ways, uh, but, and incredibly cold blooded, but this idea that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Um, I think that for whatever reason, just in human history, um, humans tend to, to really develop new, new approaches and new solutions in times of crisis. And um, I think that a lot of what we're, we're seeing now is in the metro area is people really engaging with this crisis and really being open to new solutions. And it's, it's excellent to see. So I realize 
uh, I'm at my time limit, so I will uh, hold up there and um, uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I think we are waiting. Uh, we have one more speaker, but I believe he's not ready yet, uh, unless somebody can correct me. So I think we will move into our discussion round. So I'd like to invite back all of our speakers for this portion. And you in the audience, if you do have questions, please uh, put them in the chat and uh, we'll try to draw from those for the questions. Uh, but maybe I'll, I'll lead this off here. Um, my first question to you all is, I heard a lot of, of, first of all, great presentations, really exciting work that you're all involved with. I heard uh, a lot of words that were common amongst your presentations that I think holistic was one I heard on, in everybody's presentation. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of discussion about how we should be thinking about connecting all these dots. The question I'd have for you all, uh, and we can take this in any order, would be there's there's the how, like how do we connect all these things? How do we see all these interdependencies? How do we use the waste streams as uh, feedstocks uh, is a good example. But then there's also, um, can you help translate that into a vision of what does transformation really look like? Where in your work are you seeing all of these different things coming together and then really creating that new future. I think of um, LADWP, uh, for example, the the transition to renewable energy. I mean, th at that scale, where do we see those step changes that I think we're all hungry to see? So maybe I'll, Lance, I'll start with you just because I picked on you just there, but. Uh, yeah, sure. You know, I think, um, you know, if we think about sort of how do we get to uh, net zero carbon by 2050, um, you know the the things that are uh, interdependent or integrated together is really thinking about how a, a, a zero carbon grid um, supports those goals. So it goes beyond just um, you know renewable energy to produce electricity, use it the same way you've always used it, but really thinking about how that unlocks um, real deep decarbonization in transportation and in our buildings. So. Um, you know, the governor, uh, Governor Newsom uh, announced a few weeks ago this goal for California to stop selling internal combustion engine cars by 2035. Um, so that's enabled uh, not just by, you know, the automakers producing electric vehicles. It al it's also uh, enabled by there being enough uh, places to charge your car. So that's really uh, you know, the utilities working with cities, working with the uh, companies that provide charging. Um, but you also have to think about what does that mean for grid management and how we run, a, run our grid and that a decarbonized grid uh, really does take the carbon out of the transportation sector if you, if you electrify, you know, cars and, and buses and, and uh, trucks and equipment and things like that. And then, and then, same thing. I think for buildings, where um, you know, we can we can decarbonize buildings through electrification if we decarbonize the grid. So, I think those things are sort of all tied together. And then, and then the last thing I'd say is just thinking is we also think about water. You know, a tremendous amount of energy in California is used uh, to. Uh, uh, gather, treat, distribute, um, and end uses uh, end uses of water. So, thinking about the water that uh, the energy that's Im embedded in our water systems, um, both a decarbonized grid and thinking about how we reduce sort of the energy load associated associated with water, um, will also help California meet those uh, decarbonization goals. Yeah, maybe let me follow up just there. I, I guess I'm interested more in when you're, as a sustainability leader in your organization, when you're trying to paint that picture to those that need to make these step change decisions, like what are some of those decisions that you're pushing for? What do we what do we have coming around the corner that will wow us, that will we'll see a new future than, than what we see today, rather than sort of incremental change that we see? Will it just be uh, you know, a bunch of little changes that add up to a lot, or will there be, you know, big steps that we see, if, if that helps? And feel yeah, free for I, anybody you know, to I jump think, in. I, I, I kind of think it's both, right? Because we, we've got to do the the relatively smaller changes to get to, to the big change. Um, 
and and the thing is that you know it's 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 tempting to say that there's some magic answer out there that will everybody will wake up one morning and go wow we we can do this um but but you know until that day comes if that day comes um, you really have to do everything else. And we do have those tools. We have the tools to make our, our grid much cleaner. We have the tools to make our buildings much cleaner. We have the tools to make our transportation sector much cleaner. Great. Um, ben, let's let's go to you. Let's, I guess, buildings. I guess buildings are one of those things where you have key decision points where you can make those transformational changes, like when you build them, when you choose to renovate them. Uh, you know, sim similar question to you. What how do you um, try to paint that vision of transformation? You know, I, it's a good question. And I think Nancy hit on some good points just about the, you know, the, the, the more we move to electrify a lot of our buildings that that pushes a lot of these issues really to the grid, which gives us a place of, of focus. You know, I think something that's been really positive to see in the green building movement over the past few years has just been this focus, frankly, on decarbonization as a way to wrap up a lot of these issues around buildings. And that's both, you know, the the operational carbon, so that's the the ongoing emissions of buildings, but also the embodied carbon. And I think we're starting to see some transparency in ways that we haven't before around the materials that go into our buildings. You know, whether that's concrete, steel, glass, roofing, insulation, you know, carpet, all these other materials, uh, and really looking at what's the carbon footprint that goes into that. I mean, concrete is is one of the most carbon intensive things to make. Uh, and as we look at, you know, how that, you know, what are the implications for that for infrastructure, right? This is same materials used in infrastructure. Um, we have some of the biggest projects going on in the country here in, in California and, and in Southern California in particular, you know, we have an opportunity to reduce that embodied carbon footprint going in. And while we're looking at that operational carbon footprint long term, uh, and, and I think, you know, that's been a really important shift uh, in the building world. And look, at the same time, like I said earlier, you know, technology continues to evolve. Uh, we're seeing a major shock to the real estate system right now, right? Whether it's commercial office or retail, uh, we're actually seeing positive growth in industrial, but um, those shocks create opportunities. And, and I think, you know, I, something I hadn't expected is we're seeing an increased look at technologies that can allow buildings to shift a little bit. Um, the sensor technology has gotten less expensive now. Smart buildings are, are becoming a little bit more achievable. Uh, and so that's giving us information that we can then use to, to manage our buildings more effectively. So, Excellent. Um, well, Steve, I'm going to skip to you next to play off of your your statement of, uh, you know, never let a good a crisis go to waste. I think I'm paraphrasing there. Um, how, how are you using in your work? I mean, uh, you know, let me dig into that question a little bit more or that, that statement a little more uh, about, pushing others to see a future that's that's bigger than what they see today. Sure. So last year, um, we did a resilience workshop in Manhattan Beach, and we invited, I don't know, 40 or 50 uh, community leaders, chambers of commerce, et cetera, uh, from around the region to come. And uh, it was so interesting how it was like in concentric circles that the more attendees who were closest to it attended and then you got to a couple of neighborhoods out or a couple of communities out and almost nobody came and uh, one of the things that that you know we started talking about with some folks is is there any kind of um, integration between one community and another? Do people share best practices? Do you guys talk about this or that? And um, one of the one of the answers was just basically car culture, you know, and that it was so hard for folks to go from one place to another. So you fast forward to the COVID crisis, and we're now part of a weekly and biweekly conversations where people are talking about the LA area as a whole. And that's so important because, because now we're starting to think through, okay, is Compton uh, getting, you know, are small businesses in Compton getting access to the same resources and the same services as folks are in Santa Monica? Who's doing what um, over there, you know, in, in Burbank? Who's doing what down here? You know, it's like, it's, it's creating more of that idea of, 
of seeing the the Los Angeles area more cohesively. So that's been a that's been a very promising a very promising development. I, I can't tell you in how many other uh, places where we work where people are like, I'm going to take my marbles and I'm going to be here and you be over there and everybody's everybody's far apart. So I think that 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 coordination is just a, a great part of uh, building out. The other thing, if I can, um, I'd like to talk about how you get from here to there. And I don't think you're going to see a Blade Runner type transformation of the LA <laughs> skyscape in the next 30 years or whatever. Um, uh, but what you have to think about is uh, kind of how do you adapt to ongoing technological innovation? How do you how do you create infrastructures that you can shift around with lower capital expense or lower physical imp imprint for the future? So you know, right now in this in this moment in time, we're talking a lot about metros and and subways and trains, right? That's all about like creating a very fixed, very expensive footprint. What about if we do ship to drones? Things like this. So, so one of the and and you know, um, as Ben talked about, uh, we have a commercial impact here. We have an industrial impact over there. I think that one of the things we need to talk about for the future in terms of planning is a dynamic vision of infrastructure rather than a static one. Excellent. Um, Eric, I'll, I'll switch over to you. Um, I, the really exciting technologies that, that that you spoke about. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, of new elements or solutions in, embedded in there, which could lead to some of the transformations I think we're hoping to see. Um, uh, so that that was exciting to see. I, I'm going to shift over to the, to answer. What, we did get one question from the audience, which I think you're in a good position to answer, which um, you had mentioned there was 50 different student groups on the UCLA campus that are doing different uh, sustainability things, which leads to believe there's a lot of excitement about how to get involved and how to how to be a part of of this future that we're trying to create together. And the question from the audience was, you know, what, what do you recommend to a region, a recent college graduate student uh, who's looking to get into into this work? Where do they start? Well, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of um, regional industry uh, and and um, Sort of government organized forums for for folks. I mean, what Ben does, I think, is um, one of the most important things that needs to be done is to to bring together people from all these different you know stakeholder groups to think about how do we improve our, our built infrastructure. I mean, look at think about buildings; they're distributed electricity and water consuming uh, infrastructure. And when you look at our electricity and our water infrastructure today, it's highly centralized, right? And this, this idea that, that Stephen just mentioned about dynamic infrastructure, you know, one of the things that I think we really need to be thinking about is how do we match the production uh, you know, location to the consumption location? So there is a, a, there's been a lot of thought over the last 10, 20 years, a lot of uh, I'd say study and interest and, and advocacy in moving our water and electricity generating infrastructure away from the large scale centralized uh, infrastructure into more of a distributed infrastructure, treat it, make it near where it's going to be used or consumed and, and keep it locally. Uh, and particularly with water, um, it's really expensive to move water. Moving electrons is pretty easy, but moving water is hard and, and energy intense. Uh, so that, I, th I think just playing off something that Steven said on the dynamic infrastructure piece, this is something that I think as a region, we need to be factoring into our planning and, and infrastructure investments, um, more of a distributed model, uh, if you will. Excellent. All right, I, again, I'm inviting folks from the audience to, to ask your questions. Um, Nancy, I'm going to pick on you. What, what do you have questions about from our other panelists? Let's uh, let's let you be a questionnaire. 
Well, I, I guess uh, my question would, would really be about um, how do we forge better partnerships? I think, you know, to really achieve this transformation, we, we have to kind of get uh, everybody thinking about it in the same way and working together. I mean, I think transportation is a, is a good example where, um, you know, the utilities and others are going to be called upon to uh, to provide a charging network for electric vehicles, um, but we're not the experts on where do you put it and how do you ensure that uh, you know that people have the mobility solutions that they need. So I guess for everybody really thinking about how do we how do we better do this together? You know, um, one of the things that you need is a government whisperer. And, and you need a corporate whisperer. Um, we, we were involved uh, in a number of, uh, of uh, discussions at Katrina, for example, in which we would have a utility uh, bank, um, we'd have technology, and we'd have somebody from FEMA. And we were, we were talking, and actually some housing experts, and we were talking about the problem in the Lower Ninth Ward of uh, how you had eight, eight houses uh, that had surrendered their title, but two that hadn't. And they wanted to try and create a REIT to redevelop the whole thing. And the housing and the finance and the tech guys are all going off a mile a minute. And all of a sudden, they said something that caused the FEMA guy to raise his hand and say, hey, I can help you. And everybody's like, great. He says, but we have to change the name of the whole thing. Because... I'm allowed to give you money if we do it this way, but if you do it labeled like this, I could go to jail. And so, so it caused a lot of the private sector people to realize that they were dealing with a whole different construct than from what they were, they were used to. And so a lot of times you get people kind of throwing their bats at the other sector when they don't actually understand sometimes the, the basic realities that and constraints that they have to deal with. So I think what we need is we need more translators in order to be able to facilitate those partnerships, Nancy. Excellent. Um, I'm gonna, I did get a couple more questions from the audience and Nicole asks, uh, what is an accessible way to measure sustainability? Um, how do we move sustainability from conceptual to physical? And I think that kind of builds on my transformation question from, from earlier. Um, and I did want to welcome uh, Chris, who's joined our panel, I guess, fresh off of uh, talking to Congress, <laughs> I understand. So yeah, hopefully, uh... thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'll throw that at you since <clears throat> in transportation, <laughs> how does one measure sustainability? We'll get you warmed up. Yeah, so, you know, we, we obviously have some metrics that we have put in here. Again, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. And I'm really sorry for being late for, for this forum. Uh, you know, I'd like to thank, uh, um, you know, uh, Emily and Miran for, for allowing me to be here in, in the Sikhan Institute for, for us to share our story a little bit later on. Um, you know, we, we have sustainability metrics here uh, in, the, in the organization, um, you know, not only for environment, but also for, for financial uh, metrics. And then, you know, as an industry, American Public Transportation Association has developed uh, what we call economic, economic and social sustainability metrics. You know, there's a research project one that I participated in as a uh, as a research oversight committee member. Uh, it's also out there, and you know I'd really would like to invite you know your, uh, your 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 viewers here to to check that out. Uh, you, know, you can Google economic sustainability, economic and social sustainability metrics, and then uh, and, uh, transportation research board. Uh, uh, and and then you know uh, the the other approach we have here too is that you know the uh, we are, uh, we have transformed our, our program here, uh, you know, not as a, a cost center, but actually as a profit center. You know, uh, in the last three years, uh, we have been uh, working through um, uh, generating significant amounts of revenues from carbon credit sales and reinvesting those back into our program, you know, as well as into our sustainable infrastructure. Uh, and then for those who um, may not necessarily know LA Metro um, in, in the opportunity uh, in a few minutes here, I'll, I'll try to explain that a little bit more. So. Great. Anybody else want to take the measuring sustainability question? I've got one final 
one before we switch back over to Chris and so, give his presentation. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just say um, it's it's very um, difficult uh, because there's such a diverse set of potential metrics, and you can you can be looking at environmental health, you can be looking at human health imp impacts, you can be looking at um, you know water, energy, transportation. There's no single metric for sustainability, right? There are an array of uh, indicators. And one of the things that we are, are trying to do at UCLA through the Green Challenge and through the report cards is to develop robust indicators or a whole wide range of them that exist, but then we can aggregate them. And, and in some ways, in some cases, we have to um, develop entirely new ones. Uh, like we've developed the first biodiversity index for the city of LA uh, at UCLA. And it's been implemented as part of the Green New Deal and as part of their um, uh, thinking in terms of uh, environmental protection. Um, and, and the other thing I want to uh, just mention going back, the original question that I was supposed to respond to, but I think I, I kind of got off topic a little bit. Um, but there are uh, a number of organizations, uh, for example, um, from uh, California Volunteers, and there's a Climate Action Corps um, that is out of, the, out of the office of the governor um, that you can apply to and, and um, there's funding and you can get you know, fellowships and you can uh, get involved and, and learn and, and uh, uh, that way. And there are, there are a number of other programs. I think there's some notes in the chat uh, for anyone who's interested about, uh, there's a link to the Climate Action Corps uh, and then someone else mentioned uh, Civic Spark and, and there's some other things like that too. I just wanted to circle back to that and make sure I give a response that was reasonably intelligent. All right, I'm going to I'm going to summarize kind of the a hybrid of two or three questions here. Uh, given this is we have about enough time for one more response before we switch over. Um, the, there's a, a number of different questions around how do you engage communities that are maybe skeptical and in, in both maybe rural areas uh, is is one 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 end of that spectrum, and another area are uh, things where some of the changes that you might make might cause gentrification, which is going to cause problems for the communities in which you're making the improvements from, from maybe a sustainability perspective. But if it pushes out communities from those communities, how, how do we think about that? How do we how do we communicate with folks to bring them in under the tent? So you know, if I could I don't, if I could jump in here for a moment, because I think this is an incredibly important issue. I, I think especially with everything we've seen around the impacts of climate change over the last couple of years, you know, we're only on course right now to further create a, a, a society uh, that's got further space between our classes of those who have the resources and the means to deal with climate change and those are, that are increasingly experiencing the impacts but do not have the resources to, to adjust. And so I think a big part of this is a, around education and it's around really challenging ourselves to lead with the economic development argument first in those communities. I think oftentimes that's difficult for us in the sustainability world. We always wanna say, well, this is the right thing to do and, and here's why. Uh, but I think we need to do that hard work, frankly, to, to lead with the business model uh, that creates value for those folks in the communities that, that are impacted. And, and they will come with us as long as we're providing them the context, the education, and the access to, to those jobs and the benefits of, of having a more sustainable society. And, um, you know, unfortunately, that, that's hard, right? And, and I think we are at a moment now where we need to challenge ourselves more to, to do better there. Mm -hmm. Great. Anyone else want to add on to that? Before yeah, we completely, completely agree with, with, with Ben there. You know, uh, we, we're very serious about this. Uh, we, uh, in all of our projects, uh, we go overboard you know, in, in terms of uh, hearing from our communities and what uh, uh, are the impacts of these projects, you know, and we make adjustments accordingly uh, to reduce those impacts. Uh, and, and so serious about this that um, uh, we, we even hired an, our, our equity officer, uh, as well as customer service uh, uh, executive uh, as well. Uh, and then, you know, most recently our board had um, uh, worked in a uh, next-gen uh, uh, program that essentially reinvents and, uh, and reimagines, you know, customer uh, service uh, interface of our, of our service to, uh, to, to the patrons that we have. Um, so um, this is embedded in our culture, and we're hoping that, you know, through this forum today and, and people hearing me say that, you know, you actually um, not only work with us, but, you know, uh, at any opportunity, please, please reach out to us as we reach out to you uh, to make these investments worth your while in your communities. 
Excellent. All right. Well, I would like to thank uh, Nancy, Eric, Ben, and Stephen for their portion. And I think we're going to switch over. Chris, uh, you got booted to the end for your presentation since uh, you had other plans, which we uh, uh, understand. So, but thank you all for a great discussion and we'll stay on track. So, so Chris, I don't, you have slides to share. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I, I have a, I have a few slides to share. I'll just, uh, um, I'll just really quickly. And then, you know, if there are any questions to this, uh, we're happy to, uh, to work this through. So. Great. We have, I think, about ten minutes. According to my, yep. uh, really, this will be really quick. Uh, 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 can can folks see that? Uh, well, let's see. It's uh, flickering a little. Uh, uh, let me let me go through this really quickly. Sorry about this, guys. That's right. And, and for anybody that, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just talk, talk through this while, uh, while I'm uh, working through. So essentially, you know, what we want to share is that, you know, um, LA Metro as, as an agency uh, has been at the forefront of uh, sustainability uh, in, in infrastructure. And, um, and what we uh, try to do uh, is uh, work through uh, many of the investments uh, that uh, uh, we do as an organization. And I'll just talk to the slide and, and uh, I'll, I'll share that offline for those who are interested. Uh, I'll stop sharing here. I, we can see it fine now, so go ahead if you want. Oh, you can? You can. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> you missed my intro about improvisation, so we're in the middle. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so so does that, is, it, is that clear now? Yeah, you can see this. Uh, we could, but just 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 keep going. We'll 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 keep going. So, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, you know, for those who are not familiar with the regional transit planner funder and builder and, and operator of systems here, you know, um, we we are a great partner in the community, and and we again would love to hear more. Uh, from, you know, uh, in terms of our program, uh, you know, this is uh, this is a timeline of that program. Uh, of course, the last few years, uh, we have actually. Um, our board had developed, uh, had adopted, I should say, a uh, sustainability, our sustainability strategic plan for the next 10 years. Uh, I mentioned earlier that this program uh, is uh, not just um, a program, but it is a, uh, it has developed, it's been developed over the course of the last few years to, uh, to generate revenues for our agency. You know, uh, our, our board uh, has authorized us to establish a green fund uh, and through sales of carbon credits, primarily from low carbon fuel standards, uh, markets have generated over $100 million uh, in, in revenues that we reinvest back, you know, into projects, into programs uh, in, in our communities. Uh, and then the, the, the last part there is that, you know, we've been a cost neutral program uh, in, in the last three years at least. So, and and that's, uh, those information is on uh, the show that. Uh, just very quickly, uh, it's lost in the narrative, but I just wanted to mention this, that, you know, uh, in terms of transit in general, you know, people always see my my buses uh, going through their roads and, you know, they, they have this tailpipes. But, you know, transit actually uh, is is a sustainable strategy. You know, um, our, our net emissions every year uh, are um, significant, you know, in, in this particular chart, you know, what you see here. Uh, is on, on the top uh, bar there in the top portions there above zero. Those are the emissions of our agency in terms of all of our operations, our buses, and uh, everything that we do. Uh, but the uh, salmon colored bars uh, are the net displacement resulting from, you know, uh, just moving people, getting them out of their cars, and the land use code benefits, you know, of, of, our, of our system. And as you can see there on the green line, you know, every single year, uh, you know, um, we, we actually are a net displacer of, of GHG emissions. And I won't go through the video, but uh, uh, that video pretty much uh, provides some more information. Uh, Chris, just so you know, we're not seeing your screen. So you're just going to have to give, we're going to, okay, so, like, um, it's radio today. Okay. So uh, in, in, in the sense, you know, uh, LA countywide, um, about 4%, 4% uh, emissions, if not for this metric displacement. 
Um, everything has changed, you know, here in our agency, uh, and you know, we uh, are, are working through a recovery task force, uh, and uh, in, in that sense, we're, we're essentially reimagining not only our transit system, uh, but also, you know, uh, I, I did mention this earlier about you know, the justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. Uh, we're, we're looking at and, and hope to partner at some point in the future on, on some uh, initiatives and workforce development uh, with uh, the Sikon Center and, and Cal State LA. We talked to, to Emily about, you know, some of our practitioners going to uh, Cal State LA, talking about the careers in transportation and then working through that, uh, through that program uh, and, and ensuring that, you know, this transit system not only becomes relevant, uh, but at the same time, you know, um, uh, provides the, the professionals as far as the uh, uh, resulting from our activities. Um, just a couple more, uh, and it should be done. Uh, you know, we've always looked at the effects of infrastructure on the environment. Uh, and, you know, this, this includes, you know, all of the life cycle of infrastructure, uh, but at the same time, you know, because of uh, these recent activities, all the policies, you know, we have actually looked at, you know, uh, how do we incorporate the effects of environment and infrastructure? Uh, and, you know, um, in the presentation that will be uh, shared through uh, through this con center uh, in here, you know, you'll see, you know, some of the cover pages and some of our plans that include the resiliency framework, the climate action plan, as well as our 10 year strategic plan. Uh, we always look at environmental justice. Uh, we've uh, uh, sought uh, coalition building. You know, um, uh, Professor Mazari, you know, Miran Mazari, who uh, invited me to here today, has been part of our sustainability council from the very beginning. Uh, and then uh, we also invest in community education. You know, uh, this was this is very important. As I mentioned this earlier in this remarks uh, in one of the questions. Uh, we've had partnerships with them. You know, allowing uh, GPRO, uh, you know, one, one of the work products coming of USGBC, and then also, you know, other training programs that we invest in uh, and allow the community to participate in. Uh, there's a reinvention of uh, procurement here in the organization. Uh, we, we have what we call a sustainable acquisition program. Uh, in that sense, you know, we're exerting our, our leadership and, and our influence uh, to ensure that uh, services and goods uh, throughout LA County, the very least, are actually uh, moving towards the path of sustainability. And then a couple more things uh, relative to infrastructure itself. You know, uh, uh, I have been part of uh, many conversations here in the state uh, relative to the incorporation of climate change uh, into uh, the, the, the design, uh, implementation, and operations and maintenance of infrastructure. Uh, here in the organization, we have uh, uh, adaptable because adaptive design, uh, flexible adaptation pathway model. What we're doing there is that, you know, we are incorporating as much as we can now, whatever climate changes, change data we can uh, get our hands on into the design and allow that to uh, be incorporated into the construction process and, and ensure that at least uh, from the get go, you know, we have some chance of, uh, of allowing our infrastructure to go beyond the life cycle uh, and, and the life that we expect them to be. Uh, there, uh, I alluded to this, you know, there has been an, a climate safety infrastructure working group that participated uh, on that. Uh, Assembly Bill 2800 quirk uh, in 2016. Uh, that was the uh, the legislation that, uh, that allowed us to, to work through uh, um, in having scientists and practitioners come together you know, uh, and actually look at, you know, uh, ensuring that climate safe infrastructure, infrastructure uh, should be top of mind as a policy, you know, uh, I'm uh, asking for permanent funding for, for climate science and infrastructure, reinventing the process, as well as developing standards and manuals of practice, and, and again, changes in procurement. Uh, this has been, uh, this, this legislation has been reauthorized this year. Uh, you know, uh, the governor Newsom uh, signed on uh, to it, and uh, that's going on uh, with no sunset uh, um, uh, in the next few more years. And then finally, you know, I just wanted to mention uh, that in terms of uh, the American Society of Engineers, you know, uh, I have been uh, privileged to be the chair at, uh, of the Committee on Sustainability for ASCE, the national chair for, for that committee. And we have developed a standard on sustainable infrastructure. Uh, please be the lookout on that. I'd like to uh, Institute, uh, as well as Cal State LA and all of your partners, all of our partners to, 
to actually participate in the comet period for sustainable infrastructure uh, standard that will be coming out in the next few weeks. Uh, and other additional efforts there include climate uh, uh, data incorporation into practice as well as procuring procurement documents and certification. And then finally, last year, uh, and uh, um, Dr. Mazari was part of this uh, leadership council as well. Uh, we had uh, developed a um, what we call as a global coalition of uh, uh, on sustainable infrastructure. Uh, you know, the, the current members of the coalition right now uh, include uh, the Global Covenant of Mayors, 4,000 cities across the world uh, that's looking at uh, engineers' leadership in sustainable infrastructure. Uh, also includes Resilient Shift, a uh, UK-based uh, resiliency center, uh, a couple of uh, private organizations, ASCE, AAC Foundation, and then most recently, the Institution for Civil Engineers, uh, the equivalent of ASCE in the UK. So with that, uh, thank you so much again. Sorry I'm late uh, uh, with this. So hopefully, you know, uh, some of the comments in here are very useful uh, and would like to engage with all of you offline. This is my, my contact information uh, is uh, going to be available uh, uh, if you don't see this slide. And, and please visit us at metro.net slash sustainability. Uh, a lot more information in there and what we've talked about here. Uh, and um, look forward to participating not only in in your program, but uh, working with you and, and your in your partners uh, in the future uh, through this Canon Institute. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, I think we are gonna take a short break. Um, we ran about maybe two minutes over. So uh, we'll be back at uh, 10.35 um, on, back on the main stage here. So thank you everyone and we'll see you shortly.